Hello my friends, it's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. Today we are departing California. We are gonna head off to the airport. We're gonna fly away from the sunny skies of California and fly to the sunny skies of Florida. I have had a whole laundry list of vlogs that I've wanted to do in Florida for a long time and we're gonna hit the ground running. As soon as I get there, I'm going to go to sleep and when I wake up, we are gonna do one vlog that I have wanted to do for quite a while. My friend Steve's gonna accompany us and then we are eventually gonna end up at a very famous guy's house who did some very famous things. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. All right, here we go again. We have arrived. All right, Lionhearts, I'll see you in the morning. Good night. All right, well, as promised, we are up and at it. Today, we are doing a special tribute vlog to, oh yeah, Macho Man Randy Savage. Dig it. Yeah, I'm a big, big fan of this guy. Today, I'm gonna take you to where his last moment happened and on a brighter note, we are going to go meet the man who made all of Randy Macho Man Savage's wardrobe. All those costumes you see him wear with the cowboy hats and the fringes, that was all made by Michael Braun, and what a story he has. This ought to be a fun day, let's roll. All right, we are en route to Seminole, Seminole, Florida. All right, we're coming into St. Petersburg. Alright guys, this is my pal Steve Samoan. Steve is a world-renowned comedian and a beloved wrestling fanatic. But we met through the Comedy Store. I think everybody at the Comedy Store is a wrestling fan. Yes. And so we wanted to meet up today, sadly, to pay homage to the Macho Man. Yes. Right here off to the side of the road, this big tree right here. You can see there's a giant rose here memorial it's been quite a while since this happened but sad nonetheless I decided to bring my macho man figure out here to uh, to be part of this you know Randy was interesting because he was he was the son of a famous wrestler, Angelo Poffo, but he didn't want to be a wrestler. He wanted to be a baseball player. And he was a really good baseball player, except he ended up having some injuries that made it impossible for him to continue on. So he went into the family business. He and his brother, Lanny, became wrestlers. And um, Macho Man, of course, is known for his dynamic personality as well as Miss Elizabeth. And his early days of wrestling, he met Miss Elizabeth in a gym, liked her right away and got her a job with his dad's wrestling organization as a commentator. And then when he ended up getting bigger and bigger and going off to WWF, he took Elizabeth with him. I remember they did this whole thing where Randy was seeking a manager. All these managers were trying to woo him into being their manager and they all came out to the ring after one of his big victories early on and he goes with Miss Elizabeth and of course she was like the first they consider her the first lady of wrestling because she was the first woman in wrestling that wasn't a heel she wasn't like the bad guy people really loved her but Macho was dynamic to say the least guy had an amazing character and personality beyond athletic. I mean, the guy could really do anything until he started getting injured. He, um, he had a great career with the WWF that became WWE. He was intercontinental champion. He was tag team champions. He was World Wrestling Federation champion. And um, 
Unfortunately, Vince McMahon at one point decided that Macho was too old and wanted to make him a commentator. And um, that was basically what made Randy end up leaving and going to WCW. That and he didn't really, he never really liked Vince McMahon. He, he really had a grudge against Vince McMahon because in 1987, they were doing a Legends Battle Royal and Randy tried to get his father in the Battle Royal and Vince refused. And so Randy held a grudge against this forever, basically till he died and never forgave Vince and always kept it a strictly business relationship. But sadly, this is where Macho Man crashed. This is where he passed away. Once he retired from wrestling, he became a very private person. He, he didn't, wasn't in the wrestling business really. He did some movies. He was in Spider-Man as a wrestler, but mainly he spent his time giving back to the community, going and um, participating in fundraisers for schools around the area. And he would take his parents to all their um, appointments, all their medical appointments. But once he retired, he lived out here a pretty quiet life. And one day at the gym, someone at the gym said that they knew Randy's ex-girlfriend that he dated while he was in the minor leagues in baseball. And they passed each other's uh, phone numbers off and Randy started dating her pretty much right away and they got married. And for the last year of Randy's life, he was happily married to his wife, Lynn. Now the day that he passed, they were at Perkins and they had eaten a meal and Randy had said he wasn't feeling well, but I guess that wasn't really that uncommon because he was a wrestler and his body was just always in pain. But um, as he was driving, he was complaining of not feeling well. And Lynn said, well, do you want me to drive? And he said, no, 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 I'm okay. And then as they continued to drive, they were coming towards us Randy had a heart attack and his foot went down on the gas pedal. He ended up driving over the median and Lynn grabbed the wheel and steered the wheel into this tree to avoid their Jeep from hitting any of the oncoming traffic. And Lanny, um, Randy's brother, said that this was probably the best case scenario. He said Randy was in a lot of pain, had been complaining all day of not feeling well and then for something like this to happen, he said it was, it was quick and it was painless. And there was, um, I guess when he was coming into the traffic right here, there was a motorcyclist and a bus coming. And Lanny said, you know, it, it could have been catastrophic for everyone. So at least his final days were happy. And um, there's no official grave for Randy. He didn't want one. Um, his dog had passed away like seven days before this and he had cremated him. His dog's name was actually Hercules and he had got him from Hercules, the wrestler. He had raised those dogs. And so Randy loved this dog so much and he was so private that he scattered the ashes for his dog under a tree on his property. And when he passed away, that's what they did for him as well. Now Randy was really famous for having pomp and circumstance for his entrance music and that was an homage to Gorgeous George because Gorgeous George trained Angelo Poffo, Randy's dad. However, when he passed away, Randy had stated many times he did not want that song played at his funeral because he felt that he had pretty much garnered enough off of that song and, um, and he never really thought he would be as famous as he was and he felt like he had kind of eclipsed Gorgeous George's fame so he didn't want to steal his song in death. So Steve, when you think of the Macho Man, what do you think of? What do those days back in the 80s and 90s of wrestling take you back to when you think of Randy Savage? Well, it's surreal. I want to answer your question, but it's just such a, a solemn place where we are right now that it... When I think of Randy Savage, I just think of so many good things and right. so much love and so much joy and... My first recollection is when the Mega Powers exploded. When oh it was man! Hulk Hogan versus Randy Savage, and you're a kid, and you don't know how to deal with this. Because you love them both. You love them both. This is a legitimate. And, and Miss Elizabeth's in the middle. <laughs> it was so good. I'm so grateful for all those memories. You know what's crazy is that um, when you hear a lot of the old stories, they tell about how overly protective. Randy was of Elizabeth, almost to where a lot of people say, well, that, that was codependence or whatever. I, I really don't think so. I mean, 
even though it seems like he was a lot to deal with and everybody that I've ever heard talk about Randy said he was intense to be to be blunt he was very intense I think Randy grew up in this business and he saw what the life was like and the dangers and what could come of it and he was just extremely devoted to keeping Elizabeth from falling down that path and I think sometimes the the protector in him made him probably go a little beyond that but it was sad because Elizabeth ended up passing before Randy. So like you think about a human being spending their last moments on her here. Yeah, I just can't even, I can't I even imagine. For, yeah. I pray, like that was my first thing, like, this is real, this was a soul. Who knows if anybody's praying for him, pray for him now. This, this bar, I mean, look at it. That's exactly where his Jeep made impact. Look at that, I mean, you can see it. This is where he was called home. Yeah, yeah, they said that he had an enlarged heart and a heart arrhythmia, so that's what ended up happening. There's actually a crash site photo that you can see this sign and you can see his black Jeep Wrangler hitting that tree over there. I'll match that up here. Now, Steve, we're kind of lucky today because we, I have tracked down the man who styled Randy. He's the guy who created that look of the cowboy hats and the fringes and all that stuff. And he's invited us to go to his house and talk. So that's where we're headed off to now. That's really cool. On our way, we're passing by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Raymond James Stadium. Roddy told me a story once about the Macho Man. Roddy Piper. And they were in the middle of a full-on barroom brawl, like riot. So the police had to call in backup and literally shotguns and stuff like that. They couldn't stop this fight. So the police, they were like, you know what, forget it. They called in the canine unit and they just let the dogs loose in the bar. And he said, Macho Man picked up a police German Shepherd over his head and threw him out the door. And that's when the cops just their shotguns and that's when the fight stopped. Wow. Uh -huh. All right, take a little peek at this showcase here. We have made it over to Michael's house and first thing I noticed was, look at that outfit right there. He said that was taken right out front of their house where he made everything and it's the exact same thing that he's wearing here in this action figure. Now you'll notice that Michael made all of these wonderful costumes for the Macho Man, but you also notice another guy in the pictures, don't you? Jimmy. Oh yeah, and there is a handwritten note letter. from Jimmy. Well, a letter, yeah, actually. Take a look at that, to, to Michael. To I would like to have at least four of everything, including, look at that. All right, you guys, uh, I think you guys need to meet the man that's responsible for this look. All right, this handsome gentleman in front of us is Mr. Michael Braun. And Michael, I contacted you because on a whim, I just started thinking one day, what the heck happened to Macho Man's clothes? And somehow I found an article about this crazy guy that started creating clothes in his house, and next thing I knew, he was making things for Vanilla Fudge, Jimi Hendrix, and the Macho Man, and you were gracious enough to let me come and talk to you. How did you get involved with Macho Man, Jimi Hendrix, how did this all happen? It's a funny story that I was racing sailboats. I brought a sailboat down from New York City, or Long Island Sound, to Tampa to race. I dislocated my shoulders, the doctor told me don't go near a boat for a year. And my business partner, Tony, had a proper babysitter who was maybe 14 years old. And anything he ever heard you say, he would go and steal it. So he heard us say steak, meaning we were really poor. He heard us, us use the word steak. He worked at a restaurant. 
He got a huge flying steak, put it in the garbage, wrapped it up first, put it in the garbage, went back, brought it back to the house, unwrapped it, and he comes and holds it in front of us. Here's the flying steak. I'm going, what? Needless to say, we ate it. This is 19-whatever, 60-something. Anyway, he also heard the word sewing machine. He's working at Goodwill at the time. He steals from Goodwill a sewing machine. We start fooling around making clothes and altering clothes and this is 1966-67 we're going to nightclubs people lost their minds because in those days there was just pin straight clothes there was nothing far out there was no country Japan India didn't exist nobody home and so we're we're wearing these kind of far out clothes. They're dying over them. Now I make five Nehru shirts. I sell them to a local band playing in St. Petersburg, Florida at the Blue Room for $18 a piece. Was that expensive for the time? Or? I show the money to, to, to Tony. $18 times five. I said, we're rich. Look, so it was a lot look, at the time. <laughs> we're rich. Are you kidding me? We're rich. Look at this. So from there, we made clothes for the fudge. Then we made clothes for Jimmy. Now we're up to the macho man. I get a call one day. We had made clothes for Hulk Hogan. Was a local in a local band called Ruckus. We made clothes for him. He became a big wrestling star sort of unbeknownst to me because I'm not a fan, I'm not watching it, nor am I trying to show off to someone, here's how masculine I am, you know, here's my biceps, whatever. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not in my head. So, my wife might argue a little of that, but <laughs> basically I'm telling you a story. So, I get a call one day from this very strange voice. He says, hey, the Hulkster told me you can make me some clothes. This is the macho man. I'm going, who is this? Who is this? I said, we make clothes every day, noon to six. Come tomorrow. Give me a time. He said, two o'clock he comes with Miss Elizabeth. He has red, light red, whatever, shorts with three stars on the front. And it says macho man in two inch letters across his ass. He wants this. They're like Speedos kind of, right? That style? That style. I said, dude, I, don't, I, I need real estate. I need from the ground to past your head. I don't make shorts. This is not me. I make clothes. I make stage clothes. This is, you know. So he, he sort of insisted he made a lot of money with this, he told me, and he wanted to keep going. He wants me to make capes. I said, dude, you're asking me to make wedding gowns. You know, I know what a <laughs> wedding gown is, but... I don't, I don't wear wedding gowns, I don't go to weddings, I don't know about this, you meaning this is not me. So I made him some things to get him by between what we're talking about. Then he walks in the shop one day, head down. He says, you can make anything you want. This is not, you. to someone that's creative, you can never say something like that. <laughs> I bet. You cannot do this. So. You can make anything you want. You at least want to put a price on it or a color or a type, anything. No, you can make anything you want. That's the kiss of death. Don't ever say that to Michael. But you know what's so cool, Michael, is that he was right. Like back then, the wrestlers only did robes. So you really, not knowing wrestling that much, you really kind of paved the way for cooler That's right. That's stuff exactly. in the business. He opened the door. So I make him five outfits. He wears the first outfit, the first Monday Night Raw, second Monday Night Raw. Now, we're now, now, was it like this, like head to toe, cowboy hat, jacket? Was it that look? No hat, no jacket in those days. Um, this is the very beginning. This is shirts and pants and wild stuff. What, on. what year would you guess? Maybe 88, 89? You're talking to the wrong person. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what happened last week, you know, I mean, I, I'm, this is really bad. She could tell you better. But now he comes back after the, the weeks 
and I had seen, you know, on Monday Night Raw, he wore the outfits, and he says to me this story. He said he wore his favorite outfit, you know, the first week, second week. He said, and now, and he's not telling me, he never said in his life, I don't like this. It was obviously things he liked better than others, but yeah. he never said, I don't like this, or I'm not wearing this, or this sucks. <laughs> but, so he says to me, he wears the purple outfit with the chains. That's the last one. And he, in his roundabout way, is saying, this is nothing to him. He says he goes into a dressing room, individual, puts it on. He walks out of it. Now he's in a big room with all the boys. Yeah. And these are like old ladies playing Marjan. Right. Meaning, you can lift weights, you can travel, you can wrestle. Other than that, you're just gossiping. There's nothing else to do. Yeah. Meaning that's just their life. Yeah, they play cards, right. For sure. So he, he walks out. They all turn and say, wow, where'd you get that? It's great. He's going, oh, I thought this was... Uh, and they think, uh, now he's walking down the hall, he tells me. This is his story. This is great. This is how he's communicating it. He's walking down the hall. Vince McMahon's coming the other way. He goes... Vince stops and goes, where'd you get that? That's great. And he says, that's some schmuck, whatever. <laughs> now, he's, he's standing ready to go to the ring in the opening. He walks through it. They put the spotlight on him. It pops. His word. It pops. His word also. He really gets over. Yeah. He really gets over. Yeah. That's his word. Now... It was a great day for him. And what he's saying to me, in my language, in my poetry, whatever, is, yo, dude, I have no idea about clothes whatsoever. This thing that you made was great for my career. Career. Big time. Career. It got nothing to do with, I think you're wonderful. It's got nothing to do with you're too expensive. It was too green. It's too purple. It's got too many chains. Nothing. Just go for that. And later on, maybe we're making clothes for him a year at least, maybe two. We're standing, you're going to see pictures of this huge house that we have on Bayshore Boulevard, 6,000 square feet, 1927. Behind it is a six-car garage, servants' quarters, cutting tables, cutting rooms, whatever. This place... Um, is Macho Man is in the room with me. It's a six-car garage. It's concrete floor. The clothes, sewing machines, industrial sewing machines, fabric, thread on the floor. There's one chair, and next to it is a mirror on an angle leaning against the wall. And he says to me, I'm small. Understand that his bicep is right. bigger than both of my thighs together. He's 6'2", I'm 5'7 and a half, you know, and I'm a normal size-ish. He says, I'm small. Well, obviously you see I'm a big mouth. And fortunately, at that moment, I didn't say anything. I want to say, what the, who the hell are you? You know, what are you talking Yeah, right. You're a... <laughs> and there's a no-win answer given there, you know. Thank you, you, thank you. You don't want to make him mad by agreeing with no, him. No, <laughs> so I don't even care. I'm just saying, I got nothing to say on this. You know, like, what the hell's going on? Now, two weeks later, whatever it is, WWF in those days, mm -hmm. come to wrestle in Tampa. I go there. I go up into the balcony. I want to see what is the audience seeing. So I'm studying this. Mm -hmm. This is strictly business. I just want to see the visual. Yeah. What are they seeing? Okay, now we did that. Now I'm in the dressing room. Here's whatever, 20 guys at least. They, and I'm a midget compared to the, this room. This is, these are some big people. Now, Randy, I see Randy there. I see the big show. I see, you know, Andre. Yeah. He's small compared to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's happening here, what I figured out is that these clothes make him, him compete 
on that level with those guys. He had cooler clothes than they did. All they could say is, I'm bigger than you. He says, wait till you see this. I got new clothes every single week. Week. You know, and this guy, Jake the Snake, comes out. He's got the same outfit and the same snake. Yeah. You know, or Davey Boy Smith. You know, we make clothes for him too. All I'm saying to you is this, is that he saw that this was good for his career. Absolutely. And he then just gives himself over to Mike the Lunatic, you know, he'll, and he closed. Now, to advance that story, you know, one day he tells me they made him this, wear this crown. They made him Macho King. Yeah. Fine. I'm going, you know, what am I supposed to say? Happy birthday. Yeah. You're the Macho King. Good. And he's... He's says to me after a few weeks, he said, I don't wear the crown anymore. I want to go get a hat, something else. I take him downtown Tampa. There's a place called Ebor City. It's the old time where they made cigars and all that stuff. There's a hat store. So they got everything there from top hats, English bowlers, I'm talking about a proper hat store. Every yeah. kind of hat you can imagine. We go in there, we start putting hats on Macho Man. The people at work, they're going, well, the idiots are here. We'll just go <laughs> for it. You know, we're playing around, so let's have some fun. They might spend money. Who knows? Yeah. So we put, we try all these hats on. What worked for our eyes, or my eyes, I don't know what he thought, is a cowboy hat. This is cowboy hats were unheard of then. No one wore yeah. cowboy hats except in the movies on cowboys and the people in Texas. There's no such thing as this is part of style. So we put the hat on him. Oh, I see. This is good. And then I know that I got the purple outfit with the whatever. I can have the girls cover the hat with the purple. I can make a band on it. Says Macho King, Macho Man, yeah. Macho Mania. You know, whatever. So um, the more crap I put on it, the better. The same with the glasses. Yeah. Same with the glasses. Because you really so, had them head to toe. I mean, no, other than I, the I neck. Told him, <laughs> I told him in the beginning, I need real estate, dude. I need it from the ground to past your head. You know, and what I'm saying to you as a part of this is, as I'm making these clothes, I want to see how does these glasses and this hat look with this jacket? Well, I put it on. This is laughable, and I can't tell. Now, anybody, I'll, man, woman, dog, I don't <laughs> care who comes to the shop, put this on. I'm, this is business. I'm just, yeah. put it on. I want to see what does it look like. So, now I'm going through this. I'm putting all different kind of people in. I'm realizing that half of it is Mike's lunatic clothes. The other half is this person is this. Yeah. He's carrying it off. Mm. So... I'm saying to you is that you have an internal connection with whoever this character is. Be it Jimmy, be it the Fudge, I don't care who it is, Sly, doesn't matter. You have an internal connection and you're making stuff for that person. I'm not thinking about it that way at that time. I'm just thinking what would be cool for the Macho Man. Yeah. And I'm making it for the Macho Man. Um, well, can I tell you one thing? Sure. Um, Steve and I were both friends with Roddy Piper. One of the stories Roddy told me was he said, Macho was very frugal with his money. He, he liked to save his money, but he saw that, that a costume did a lot for your career, so he spared no expense. So that tells a lot how much he trusted you that he would put his money into your hands because he did not like to do that very often. Okay, I never heard the story before. I knew that he is number one, as to add to the story, is that he is a serious person and very, very, very hardworking. Right. Hardworking. Absolutely. All the girls, Elizabeth and all the ones after her, <laughs> complained. He's working 24 hours a day. They're all looking for the day off. Let's go to the beach. Let's party. Whatever. No. He's working all the time. That's him. That's his nature. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking right or wrong. I'm saying, this is the macho man. It's serious. This is a no fool around kind of thing. Any way you want to slice it. Well, your timing and on this couldn't have been better too because 
Hulk Hogan left wrestling for a while to to be to concentrate on acting, and they needed someone to be the big star. And I gotta think that Randy's wardrobe and his image just growing right at that same time. He was a, exactly who they put in to be the champion. That lady that's in the room, my wife, that I'm not pointing any <laughs> fingers to, she says to me, you know, uh, I'm gonna uh, make a a, a, a little you know, a thing, a bio, here's a picture of you, here's a picture of the art. Michael Braun, born here. You know, the website's Michael Braun Art. Michael Braun, born here, raised there, went to school here, made clothes for, and then, you know, there's the 40, 50 names. Whatever. Yeah. Name dropping. And people say, did you meet Macho Man? Did you meet Jimmy Man? <laughs> and I tell them, I did, we did it all on the internet, you know. There was no such thing as the internet in Jimmy's day. The beauty of the time, I'd like to tell you how wonderful I am. It's a total lie. This is just right time, right place. This is just destiny. Yeah, you guys, you guys were meant to meet. And he could pull off these clothes. I'm just telling you, you bring me 10 people, 10 people, pay them, yeah. come. We're going to all put the Macho Man's outfit on this one and say, do you buy this? You're going to laugh at me. You won't even say no. You're yeah. just going to laugh. No, this is no good. No, this is no good. And I tried it on lots of people. It doesn't work. He carries it, and this, but the same for Jimmy. People put on his clothes at the time. As we're making them, people would see them, and they go, can I try this? No, you can't try it on, but believe me, it wasn't them. Mm. And it's not an insult to anybody or a compliment. It's just, this is Macho Man's thing that we were given yeah. yes, to make these lunatic clothes for this guy and he could carry it off. And the crazier it was, the better it was. We would cut all these clothes. Now we're bringing them, or she's coming. This is Vera Snyder. She did the sewing for him. So this is like all different kind of things that we're cutting. You see this very carefully done. All these are separate pieces, the whole thing on the back. This is hand painted. This all this this pattern is hand painted on the hat. I was on, wondering how you did that. It's, it's it painted by hand. Wow. Here's glass. how do you, could he see out of the glasses? Those oh, I often you wondered find, about that. You're gonna, find, you're gonna find this out. I'm gonna put the glasses on you, and you're gonna learn a lesson in life. And the lesson is, you could cover. 80% of what's going on in front of you and and your brain fills in the rest You can see through the glasses perfectly. It's just amazing hard to believe and here in the upper right hand corner Is a very beloved son. He would bring his father and mother proper Jewish mother proper Italian father There's the dog was that Hercules. I don't know what it, the dog's name was. I'm mean, this is my partner Tony by the way it's an old picture from the day. This is in the Bay Life newspaper. Um, That's cool. Then you made these all for Jimmy. Yeah. Which we're going to do another vlog on a lot of that stuff. So here's Macho Man standing in front of the shop. So that's hand painted, but to match all this stuff that I'm putting on, you see all the fringe and stuff. This is very carefully done. Hard work. Here's me with a dislocated shoulder and a pajama top on, and he's got his hand around. We're just playing in front of the shop. But he says to me one day, I got some cowboy boots. You know, I want to, I, I have a company that makes cowboy boots. Can you, can you fix me up with this? You see, every one of these panels is a different, pa different pattern of spandex that they put onto the leather. I told them where I wanted it to go. You know, you're going, have you lost your mind? It's a stretch velvet, nylon. This is hand painted, then glitter's put on it while it's still wet. Then it's dried overnight. Wow! What? I'm looking at, you did his portrait. That is so great. So, wow. He wore that in one of them. Right? Yeah, this is pictures of him in this. That is so cool. And you cool. see how thin this fabric is. Very, yeah. 
You're in trouble, brother. Oh, Can you believe that we get to so wear some of cool, Macho Man's you. glasses? Come on, Susan. Whoa. Keep Steve, on, put them on. on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dig it, brother. <laughs> wow. wow. I like those. Those are so great. Do you have people just hitting you up all over the world wanting these all the time? Asking you to remake them or anything? Yes, guilty. Oh my gosh, those are the glasses! Wow! Do you have glasses? Do you have... I'm, I'm a wrestler. I want wrestling clothes. I want clothes like Jimmy. Yes. Did you have an agreement with Macho to like never reproduce anything? Or what was it just... An agreement. Since, since here's, you here's created the, it, you created here's, it. Here's the agreement. Do you want to know the agreement? And this is from my partner, Tony. You come, you want clothes. You want a $500 outfit. I say, I need half down, you give me $250. I just make the clothes, you give me the other $250, you leave. There's no nothing. That's the whole entire whatever thing of it. Wow. You can feel that. It's really thick. <laughs> Macho's Good. pants. What was this? Oh, this is the... It's Macho. They complained because he had worn so many glitter outfits so many times. Sometimes this glitter can come off. You see it's here, it's here. It's all over the ring. He came back to me and said they complained they had to sweep the ring, vacuum it, whatever. They were pissed off about it. Those are so Susan cool. Susan put this out here for you. That's outside the shop. Oh, wow. And their personal photo album. Look at that. That's one of his Slim Jim. That's a very famous... Yeah, I was, I was dating him when he made Slim Jim commercials. You were dating Macho Man or Michael? No, Michael. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I fooled her. Look at Macho, that great. Macho Man did a really cool story, uh, a thing for me one time, because uh, I was working in a middle school. So I was working at Monroe Middle School as a video production uh, person. I was the teacher and I would film, you know, we would have a morning show, about 800 kids, we'd broadcast it live. And so uh, Michael was making clothes for the Macho Man. And I said, gosh, these kids love wrestling. So um, I said, you think you can get Macho Man to maybe come or do something? So Michael uh, says, sure, I'll get him, you know, he, he'll, he'll do something for you. So he got um, a tape recorder, and he's done this several times. <laughs> and he just went three, two, one, and said, you know, he told Macho Man the background of the, the school and all that. So, so we re he recorded Macho Man going, hey. This is the Macho Man, you know. Uh, you kids better behave. Miss Fuller, you know, I'll come down there and get you with my tag team partner, right? So it was just an audio, right? Yeah. Well, I had a, a promo picture that Michael had of Macho Man, so we have something called an Elmo, which is like a video camera that projects the, the picture. So I put it on the Elmo, I played the audio tape. I said, oh, we have a special guest today, you know, and I, and then they play, and I played this audio with that video, I mean, you know, just with the picture. We must have had 35, 40 kids come running down to the media center, which is where we broadcast from. Yeah. They, they're thinking the macho means right yeah. there. You know? <laughs> so it was pretty, it was pretty cool. They really loved it. I heard he was really good with kids. Very good with kids. They said when he retired, he would uh, always read the nightmare, or the, it was the night before Christmas, uh -huh. every year for a charity yeah. event. Yeah. And, and uh, also he used to babysit one of our friends, uh, Martin Marcus's little girl, whenever he <laughs> no Martin kidding! Do something. Oh. Yeah. The Macho and, Man and, is and your babysitter? Yeah, it's on that documentary, I think, uh, where he, he uh, Mart, uh, our friend Martin Marcus came home, he's a, you know, chiropractor, came home and his little girl was teaching him the next day where Macho Man had taught her how to do, <laughs> do the elbow move. drop. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, well, <laughs> yeah, a little much for my little girl, but he, you know, he really was good with kids. These photo albums are just absolutely amazing. Look at all of this. I just, I can't idea. believe that. I can't wait till we hear the Jimmy stories. My gosh. <laughs> okay, so once upon a time, a long, long time ago, I'm making clothes for the Macho Man. The phone rings. 
this is so and so from such and such advertising company in Connecticut, Stanford, Connecticut. We we're gonna have Macho Man, you know, back our product for Slim Jim. We there's twelve of us here or nine of us sitting around a table in this advertising company and I, and we want you to make his clothes and this and that. And I said fine. And I said what do you want? <clears throat> Obviously they had no idea. Not a clue. What do you want? So I say here's what we're going to do. First of all, I'm not talking to a group of people ever again. Give me one person to talk to. <clears throat> I'm going to make him three outfits. Your colors that you're telling me is black, red, and yellow. I'll make three outfits. They'll all be interchangeable. You'll shoot it and when you get them in front of the... you'll see what works, what visually you think mm -hmm. is happening that day. They said, okay. I said, send me five grand to get me started. It's going to be ten grand minimum, you know, and the outfits are going to be Macho Man and Slim Jim. We make them, and you're seeing pictures of maybe 30 or 40 percent, maybe 45 percent. Other things didn't sing to them mm -hmm. as well as whatever they were picking, so it was their choice, but understand you're dealing with someone that has not a clue, no idea of what's going on here. I don't mean it in a bad way. All I'm saying to you is that you see the outfits. If you saw the pieces that were no good or didn't make it, you'd say, oh, this is cool. It may not have been that cool to them for selling their product mm. with his image on the Slim Jim box in the 7-Eleven. That's what you've got to think right, about. Right, yeah. So you're looking at it a completely different way. And what I'm saying to you is that I got, in life, educated to, I'm just in school. Mm. End of story. I'm just in school. Okay, what's today's class? Some classes you don't want to be in. Being a human being. Yeah. Being kind. Being loving. Yeah. Being tolerant. Being whatever. Um, so I saw that I was in school, and I tried to learn the lessons that everyone has these strengths and weaknesses... Randy is not visual. He would wear the wrong hat, wrong glasses, wrong shirt, wrong pants, whatever, backwards, boots, wrong. And I would say to, to Elizabeth and others as they came after her, you know, put this together. He doesn't know what's going on. You can't say wear, the, wear only this this way. He, he's not getting it. There's nobody home there. And it's not an insult. It's just... This is not his yeah, thing. Yeah. There's certain things he could do great, and certain things nobody home. That's why you guys yeah. were great collaborators, though. I mean, you, you, he was, he had the personality that you got to paint the picture of. You know, color, exactly. colored in the picture. Exactly. So I got who he was as a character. Meaning, I'm watching Monday Night Raw. I start going out with the boss lady, the really romantic Monday Night Date. I mean, really <laughs> romantic. She comes to the house, turn on the television, baby, Monday night raw. We're going to see the clothes that I delivered on Friday, either that Friday before or two weeks before or three weeks before. We're looking at the clothes, and this is the romantic date. But I'm trying to see, it's one thing, what does it look like to my eye in the shop? Then there's another thing, what does it look like in two-dimension moving on a screen? Yeah. In, what what do I got here? And meaning I'm competing with, in my mind, I'm saying, okay, we're going to take in the television, we're going to rotate it 180 degrees. Now it's on, upside down, and we're going to watch this thing for an hour. Mm. What stands out? That means the commercials, the other wrestlers, the announcers, the audience. Mm. The, so, and I'm looking at the commercial, I'm looking at the audience, I'm looking at the announcer. What's... How does Mike win this? Yeah. Meaning, how does Mike win? You see it. This worked. Mm, this, is, this is an eight and a half. Yeah. Oh, that's a ten. That one worked, Mike. You had a good day there. And and beyond even 
the wrestling community seeing those, Slim Jim became a huge commercial all the time. So your your costumes were seen by people that didn't watch wrestling. They're seeing those cowboy hats and exactly well, sure. what's right there. I mean that I remember seeing when he um he was doing the commentary for quite a while when he went to WCW. I think Eric Bischoff said one of the reasons we wanted Randy was because with Randy came Slim Jim. This one I really love. This is when Randy was tag team partners with the Ultimate Warrior. This was the Ultimate Maniacs. And we make clothes for the Ultimate Warrior too then. Wow, and then you said this Davy Boy Smith, British Bulldog, you made that, and Hulk Hogan's clothes from No Holds Barred. <laughs> which I loved. Because I got an assortment. You're gonna have some golden days, you're gonna make some right decisions, some wrong decisions, doesn't matter, just go for it. It's what Randy was saying in his way, in his poetry, in his time, when he's saying, you can make whatever you want, you know, with his head down, you know, he wasn't playing a part then, meaning he's trying to communicate an idea to Michael, go for it, dude. You told mm -hmm. me 15 times you can make all these crazy clothes, you know, and you don't want to make this capes and crap, you know, you don't know about it. You don't have a feeling for it. You're just wasting your money. Okay, so here we go. Look at that. His madness shirt. And then on the other side, it's the uh, NWO, Flipping. I think. So, right? yeah. Oh, that's so cool. And that's hand painted. New, new world order. All right, we've made it over to Bayshore. So if you heard Michael while we were in his house, he used to live over here on Bayshore and that's where Randy used to come and get the clothes and try them on. So we're gonna go to that house. He said it's for sale again, so maybe we can get a good look. So here we are. This is Michael's old house for decades. This was his home and as he told us, behind here is a six car garage and this is where he made all of those outfits, did all of that fashion for all those years, and this is where Randy Savage would come to pick up those clothes that we got to check out all the designs of today. And they said those photos, whenever we saw anything in the driveway, those were taken right over here, back there. Now I didn't want to go out to Randy's last home because you can't see anything. Apparently he couldn't get away from fans in his later years so he got a pretty secluded house with guard dogs and a big gate and everything so that's where his ashes were scattered right there at that tree with his dog Hercules. So since he didn't want people in his property, he originally had a beach house and couldn't get any solace so that's why he moved away from there. I figured I don't want to include that in this video. Alright my friends, I think we're going to call it a day. Thank you Chris Wall, Sherry Hancock, Alan Cumming, Marsha Zacher for becoming my newest Patreons. Thank you all for watching. Good